What's up, beautiful people, and welcome to another sexy video. It is I, your beacon of Amudin, your steward of Gundor, your genius billionaire playboy, basic YouTuber philanthropist, Supercliff. And would you kindly hit that like and subscribe button for every little bit helps in this YouTube world. And to quote King Faden, so it begins. And indeed it does. Because today we are talking Future State, Superman of Metropolis, issue number one, written by Brandon Easton and Sean Lewis, and drawn by a slew of artists. Valentin DeLandro, Kali Hammer, Michael Avon Omen, and John Timms. Let's do this. Following the events of DC's Dark Knight's death metal, our story takes place sometime in the future. A glimpse into a possible world among the infinite multiverse. Inside the city of Metropolis, where we are given a little monologue from Jonathan Kent regarding the current situation. Check it. Andridge Trojan, founder of Trojan Solutions, damn, already sounds pretty evil, has been turning city citizens into nanotech, connecting technology to their entire being. Since then, Trojan managed to cripple LexCorp, sending Lex Luthor into exile, and now he's just recently ordered his zealots to establish the city of tomorrow as the Free Republic of Metropolis, which in turn causes the military to react. And though it's reported that Trojan has abandoned the city, the mad scientist apparently has left behind his most dangerous piece of technology, which of course, the military wants. And as war rages within the streets of Metropolis, John mentions to us, the reader, that he's been patrolling the city of Metropolis for over a decade, with one year doing it solo. And though the cries of a child will always bring John to guard the helpless, we get a sense that John fears that there will be a day or he isn't fast enough to save the world. But until then, Jonathan Kent, Superman of tomorrow, will do what has to be done. Taking bullets to the face. Oh yeah. The military then calls out to John, informing our hero that he is committing a hostile act by essentially preventing the military from completing their mission, that being the reoccupation and control of Metropolis' streets from the nanotech zealots, along with stopping Trojan's invention known as brain cells. John then provides us the reader with another monologue session, this time in regards to brain cells. Check it. The technological ball of terror is an artificial intelligent that is connected to the zealots through quote-unquote upgrades done to their skin. And because of this, the upgrades allow brain cells to control the people's movements, thereby making them slaves. And according to John, it's apparently both his and Supergirl's fault which led to the creation of brain cells, for it was the defeat of the Superman baddie Brainiac which allowed Trojan Solution scientists to confiscate Brainiac's skin in order to infuse it onto brain cells. So yeah, basically brain cells is related to Brainiac, which is really, really bad. Anyways, John is fully aware that the military is just doing their job, but in order to initiate his plan towards keeping Metropolis safe, Superman needs to relocate brain cells somewhere outside Metropolis, because once he does that, brain cells hold over the zealots throughout the city will wane. In addition, because John knows the military wants brain cells, he knows that by removing the AI, the military will give chase, therefore de-escalating danger within Metropolis. Now, can I just say that Brain Cells is a ginormous asshole? Because whilst John is moving Brain Cells outside Metropolis, dude is just ruthlessly trash talking our hero to the max, telling John that he's nothing like his father, saying that he's human and that he possesses just enough Kryptonian blood to merely make himself interesting. And that during the course of the last 10 years, from fighting villains such as Brainiac, the Five Emperors, the Golden Gods of Creon, and even the Time Luchadors, John would have lost the city a million times without the assistance from true Kryptonians, such as Kara or his father, Kalar Kent. But unfortunately, John doesn't give a singular damn because once he and Brain Cells are outside the city limits, John calls upon Kelix to initiate Operation Glass Houses. Once activated, we watch as the city of Metropolis, the city of hope, truth, and justice, is shrunken and bottled up, similar to Kandor. Now, though John clearly did this in order to protect Metropolis, it seems that not everyone is 100% on board with this recent stunt, as we later see Supergirl hovering over a large hole of missing land where the city of Metropolis used to be. Later at the Fortress of Solitude, Brain Cells continues to trash talk John, even going as far to impersonate his father in Clark's voice. But John pushes back, telling Brain Cells that it put microchips in the, into people's veins, essentially turning Metropolis into its own circuit board. However, Brain Cells counters John, telling the young hero that he, that he was making the humans less predictable, providing them with confidence to live a happier life, something John is failing to do. To which Supergirl agrees with the villainous AI, as she suddenly appears to confront John in a manner of defiance towards his decision of having shrunk Metropolis. John tries to calm down Kara, but she don't give a damn as she informs John that they are going to hand over brain cells to the military and unshrink Metropolis. And while Kara is getting angry by each passing second, 
John takes note of Brain Cell's strange fixation towards Kara, because ever since she arrived, his circuits have been glowing, getting more and more intensified. Kara then begins to insult John, going as far as telling him that a decade ago, she told Clark that his son wasn't fast, strong, nor decisive enough to take his place. Burn! <laughs> Yet, despite the insults, John is still unwilling to budge on his decision, which leads both John and Kara to battle. Once Kara smacks John across the face, John notes that Brain Cells is cheering for Supergirl. John finally demands Brain Cells to reveal as to what's the deal with his circuits. Brain Cells, being the asshole that he is, is ecstatic to oblige John's request, telling the young Superman that the AI's bio-wiring is connected to a, a Neurodrum core. Wait, what? <laughs> no worries, check it. For Neurodrum is, is sort of similar to Kryptonite, which is an element that affects pure Kryptonians, but the difference being is that it causes them to become more inclined towards anger. The more you know. <laughs> After Supergirl punches John, which sends him flying outside the fortress, John is then suddenly confronted by the military drones, which are revealed to be armed with Kryptonite blasters. But unfortunately for the military, John decides to be a dick as he pulls a move, informing the drones that the Fortress of Solitude is technically not part of the United States government. So technically the US is trespassing an airspace that is technically not theirs. However, Kara doesn't give a hot damn as she flies up and punches John in the back. And while Kara and John continue to duke it out, John explains to Kara as to why he decided to do what he did. Because days earlier, prior to this issue, both Supergirl and John had just taken out a fire at the old Steelworks lab. However, John decided to stay behind because he knew that the people of Metropolis were feeling disposable due to the Trojan and the Zealots. In fact, things were so bad that the people didn't even trust the government. That's a first. Joke. <laughs> Therefore, John stayed behind in order to gain people's trust. And after John talked to several of the people following the fire, John decided that in order to fix the city, he needed more time. Therefore, he shrunk Metropolis so that he could contend with brain cells in the military, leaving the people out of harm's way. Now, unfortunately, this only enrages Kara even further. Supergirl then calls out, proclaiming that sovereign airspace or not, Metropolis must be returned. Suddenly, a large ship of sorts comes crashing through, destroying all the military drones. Shocked that neither Supergirl nor John could hear the ship's incoming arrival, John and Kara fly back down towards the Fortress of Solitude. Once inside, the two heroes find that the bottle up Metropolis is missing. Brain Cells reveals to the heroes that Metropolis is, is actually safely secured with it within its care. Brain Cells also tells John that he's predictable, much like all humans. It's here where Brain Cells circuitry begins to glow once more, but Kara fails to notice as she charges towards the AI. However, due to the Nero Drim's effect, Supergirl is taken out. As John attempts to care for Supergirl, Brain Cells reveals that unlike the others, he actually agrees with John, and that isolation was the only choice towards protecting Metropolis. John then suddenly realizes that Brain Cells must have anticipated John's decision into shrinking Metropolis, and that this entire time Brain Cells has been nothing more than a puppeteer, all in order to confiscate Metropolis for himself. Oh John, what have you done? Inside Metropolis, we see the reintroduction of the second Mr. Miracle, Shiloh Norman, who, after watching the city being bottled up, decides to suit up to assist the people, knowing that fear is fuel for panic. Therefore, people need hope if they're to make it out of the situation in one piece. Seeing the Star Labs media pull up, Mr. Miracle takes off. Though he hates being rude, the unfortunate truth is that with the absence of facts, the media tends to inject sensationalism, which leads further to mania and stupidity, something which Silo is currently trying to avoid from escalating. Mr. Miracle then calls upon his mother box in order to scan the barrier that's trapped the city. Suddenly, the mother box's alarm starts to go off, to which Mr. Miracle speculates that whomever is responsible for the barrier has summoned the welcoming committee, aka security. And oh my god, do the security robots look identical to the Dowell battleships from Warhammer 40k? I digress. <laughs> After many panels featuring Mr. Miracle taking out the mechs with style, Shiloh's mother box informs him that both the barrier and the mechs contain a similar molecule signature, and that she needs more time to analyze. However, time is something our hero doesn't have, as he is suddenly knocked out of the sky by more mechs. And if those Shiloh manages to live following the impact, mech battle tanks arrive as they converge on a wounded Mr. Miracle. Our next story takes place within Metropolis, six months past the initial shrinking event, where we see a cloaked figure called Honest Mary holding Jimmy Olsen hostage. Whilst elsewhere down in the streets, we see a new hero who is currently driving an ambulance that is armed with a ton of explosives, enough to take out Metropolis University. And who is this mysterious hero, you ask? Well, it's here where we are introduced to the DC's new iteration of the Manhattan Guardian, named Jake Jordan, who, if you all don't remember, was actually introduced back in DC's The New Age of DC Heroes. 
However, I digress because no one cared. Anyways, as shit begins to hit the fan, we rewind the clocks back 24 hours prior to this incident, where we see the new Guardian meeting up with Jimmy Olsen at a local diner, whilst a protest is being conducted nearby. Jimmy explains to the Guardian that while Superman is away, and with John doing whatever it is that he's doing, the people need to see superheroes patrolling the streets and protecting the innocent. Because clearly, as we can see outside, the city is in dire need of a morale boost. Suddenly, the protesters outside break through the diner, causing chaos, while others rush towards the barrier, attempting to break free from John Ken's imprisonment. Guardian is then shown in attempting to calm down the rioters, but sadly it's to no avail, as they perceive the Guardian as nothing more than a fascist. And while Guardian throws his shield, subduing many rioters in the process, Guardian manages to locate the riot leader. But before he can pursue the woman, Diner Waitress calls upon the Guardian, wondering if the hero is good to pay for the check, since Jimmy apparently had dipped during the fighting. Twelve hours later, we pick back up with the Guardian, who's asking Rosa, the waitress, for any leads regarding Jimmy's disappearance, to which Rosa responds, saying that this is Metropolis, baby. Weird shit happens all the time. Suddenly, one of the Daily Planet news kids busts through the diner to call out the Guardian, saying that Jimmy Olsen has been kidnapped off the street, for Jimmy had found out who the mob leader is. That being a woman named Honest Mary, and apparently she has just rigged a bomb on a driverless ambulance, which is currently heading towards Metropolis University's cybernetic laboratory, an institution originally funded by Mr. Trojan. And so, from Honest Mary's point of view, this bomb attack is basically a giant FU to the whole concept of fascism, since Trojan hated humans and only wanted to enslave them. We soon turn to Guardian, who's giving chase to a runaway ambulance, and though Guardian is able to board the ambulance, our hero is shown to be having a difficult time with handling the vehicle. And just like we saw in the beginning, Guardian decides to steer the ambulance ambulance off the bridge and into the water below. But before we can see the Guardian escape, the ambulance blows up, leaving us with a cliffhanger. Did Guardian manage to survive, or did Guardian perish as a hero? Dum dum dum! Future State Superman of Metropolis, issue number one, was a really fun issue which gave us a future where John Kent Superman has taken the mantle as the main Superman. And though this issue was fun, wonderfully drawn, and colored, oh my god, was the, was the art in this book fantastic. It's a wacky start to say the least. And what I mean by that is, the beginning felt a lot like a Scott Snyder Dark Knight's issue where you're immediately dropped into the action without any preparation whatsoever. Now that's not to say that's a bad thing, but I will say that the issue is giving off a sense that these future state books are very fast paced. Like, hey, we gotta hurry up, sort of arcs. Therefore, I would say that's the main problem here. Also, although I appreciate the creation and reintroduction of, of characters, there's a lot crammed into this issue. Therefore, the whole John Ken storyline is paused as we take a look at, at the side stories following the issue's main story. The Mr. Miracle story, though good and simple, didn't really grab me, but the quote-unquote new Manhattan Guardian, who by all accounts is a shield swing and EMT, is actually a pretty dope character, and I wouldn't mind if the version of Guardian was later introduced in the regular Superman books in March. Overall, Future State Superman Metropolis, issue number one, delivers an interesting start to its story, but it definitely requires the reader to take in a ton of explanation slash backstory. It's sort of like swimming in the ocean. At first, you're like, oh shit, it's really cold, but after a few minutes, it feels nice. Future State Superman Metropolis, issue number one, gets an 8 out of 10. Giggity goop.